to the Built on Air podcast, the variety show for all things Airtable. Each episode, we cover four different segments. It's always fresh and different and lots of fun while you get the insider info on all things Airtable. Our hosts and guests are some of the most senior experts in the Airtable community. Join us live each week on our YouTube channel every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And join our active community at builtonair.com slash join. Before we begin, a word from our sponsor, OntoAir.com. Any business running on Airtable gets the value that Airtable has, but also needs a few more functions to complete their operations. That's where OntoAir comes in. It's a suite of tools for any business running on Airtable to maximize your operations efficiencies and automations. One customer, John, states that OntoAir enables his business to function properly without having to think about building their own software, and that is pretty invaluable. The OntoAir Airtable apps are amazing, and we use them often and are very happy with the results. So join John and hundreds more customers and take your Airtable to the next level with OntoAir. Sign up today with promo code BUILTONAIR for a 10% discount. Check them out at OntoAir.com. And now let's check out today's episode and see what we built on air. All right, welcome everyone. This is Built on Air, the podcast, the first edition of our live show. Very excited to be with you and um, we have the whole crew with us. So. Two of these faces might be familiar. I'm probably the least popular of the group. Um, I thought we'd start off the show with introductions, and I will begin. My name is Dan Fellers. I am the founder of Built on Air, as well as OpenSide and Onto Air. We are a company that um, services Airtable-only clients and provide products and services that sit on top of Airtable, as well as run the community behind the Built on Air. Um, brand and so excited to, to be with you on this new format. Um, we'll be doing lots of exciting new uh, styles of, of um, episodes and talking through a lot of different things going on in the Airtable world and different products and talking to a lot of great people. And I have with us our two um, Built on Air podcast hosts that will be joining us um, as much as possible on this format. So we thought we'd kick it off with introductions, so we'll start with Camille to Ali. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Camille. I've been a host on the Built on Air podcast for a couple seasons now. Um, I am just a, just an Airtable hobbyist who also occasionally makes apps under my company, Chameleon Air Apps. Great. And Ali? Awesome. Hello. My name is Ali Alosa. I've been a built on air host for about the same time as Camille. I'm super excited to be doing this new format. And um, I've also been an Airtable consultant for a little over two years now, which is kind of crazy. Um, and just love Airtable. Very good. One of the great things I love about Airtable is the community around it. Um, it's been great to work with Camille and Ali over couple years and get to know them better as well as a lot of other amazing people that we've had on the podcast and also in our um, own Tanner community. So we're glad that you're a part of it and can join us. Um, I'll give kind of an introduction. This is our first show that we'll be doing in this format. Um, we have almost 100 episodes of direct one-on-one -on -one interviews with, with people doing amazing things with Airtable. So we have a large library that you can find on builtonair.com of individual one-on-one -on -one interviews that Camille and Ali have done with people. Um, going forward, we're gonna try something new and see how this goes. It will be a live show every Tuesday morning at this time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And we'll be um, doing different things. We'll typically do a roundup of what's going community, what people are talking about, any new product release features that Airtable has made. And then we'll do a variety of different shows where we might um, do a live build of a different uh, mini application, or we might um, bring on a guest to talk about something that they're working on, 
or we might do a live competition, which we're going to do today, kind of an Iron Chef style format where uh, we'll kind of build on top of an existing base and make it better. So a lot of different fun, new, this is a, kind of a variety show. We're trying to things up a bit and make it fun and exciting. And it is live, so bear with us as we as we work through this and um, and try this new format. So thanks for being a part of this. Um, so our first segment we're gonna call we call it round the bases. So we're gonna go through different community sites and see what people are talking about and what's going on. And I'm sharing my screen. Um, we'll start with with the community. Obviously, the the primary source of everything. Um, Airtable specific. So this is a great place. If you're not spending time here, this is obviously where a lot of people are asking questions, looking for help. Um, this is also where you can typically direct answers from employees of Airtable. So just looking at the latest of what's going on. Um, I know Camille and Ali are, are typically more engaged in this community um, than, than I have been lately, but um, looks like the typical questions. I always like the, the show and tell where people are showing um, what's going on. So it looks like there's a date formulas, um, ways to improve your date formulas. Um, what else we got going on? <clears throat> Uh, something I've noticed over the past week, couple weeks, um, there seems to be a trend of people asking for um, a, a workaround to auto numbers. Uh, the auto number field is uh, fairly limited in that it's it's literally just a number that counts from one to infinity, um, but you can't have a prefix or a suffix and people want custom ones. And if you want it to renumber at the start of the year, you can't really do that. And so I've seen a couple people ask recently, is there a, a way to do so? And there is using automations in a script, um, but it's a little bit more difficult to figure out if you don't know JavaScript. Yes. Definitely. Also saw they were, um, when you delete a record, you sort of lose that, that order and you mm -hmm. have like, you know, mm -hmm. phantom numbers that wanna be able to refill those, somebody asked, but. Yeah, that's definitely not possible without uh, doing it yourself. No, oh, there's one. I, I, and I answered, yay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if um, there's another one where I actually provided a script somewhere on the community forums. It was fairly recently um, that will count. Uh, we'll put whatever prefix you want um, and then a number with like padded zeros up until, yeah. you know, 999 and then when the next year hits it should recount with the with number one so um you can find that somewhere on the community forums <laughs> <laughs> that's something i employ a lot as well like using automations to start the numbering like and doing it with groups so if mm -hmm. you like have a count field on whatever table you're linking things to, you can use that to just add one for every time you add a new record. Yep. Um, been using that a lot. And the padded zeros is really helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, here's one that um, actually, who's also in our in our built on air community, um, brought up in our community yesterday. So they've updated um, supporting HTML within emails so that's a great Ooh. addition i actually needed that for a for a project i was working on last week and so it's it's timely it's not every html so it's not a complete adoption of html like they don't support um, tables uh, build them yourself with with span they actually don't support div tags which i thought was interesting they support span but not um, but they do support CSS as well, so you could you could Im implement your own CSS. Um, so that's a great a lot of emails through the automations, and you're using their their email sender. Mm -hmm. um, that comes in handy. So Something good... I'm not sure if they. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say I don't think I've seen anybody post this yet, and I was just telling this to Camille before we got started, but. Over the weekend, I went and I added a lookup field of a single select, 
and it retained the same coloring and look and feel as the single select on the source table. And it even for filters, like it, you don't have to use contains. You can do it just like you could with a regular single select on the main table. If you're using a lookup now, you can have like a drop down of all of the options in that filter. That's if is, you use the, uh, the, the search step. Um, if you're, in, in no, the if you're like filtering. Yeah, reg with view filters. Yeah. Um, oh, with yeah. view filters. Gotcha. Yeah, which is very nice because it uh, with single and multi-select, they have different um, operators for is or has any of or does not have any of. And now that you can select from the original list of options from that field in another table, you know, you can, without having a crazy filter set up, you can have, you can use the regular ones that you might be more accustomed to if you were working with one table. Yeah. Exactly. And it, it's also really helpful for like situations where you might have a status field that's like active and inactive. Like some people might struggle to be able to write a formula that can encapsulate that properly because inactive includes the word active. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, you would have to make it case sensitive or something. And yeah, that's, you know. Yeah. 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 So a few things going on. I haven't seen uh, much product release as far as new features looks like april was pretty slim march was they, a big one they posted to the community forums a um april updates and it was very slim there wasn't too much in it um nothing really major that i can recall it's mostly little fixes um just kind of across the board yeah mm -hmm. so okay so minor minor updates um Hopefully they're still working and more to come on that front. It's always fun to see when they when they put out a lot of new product updates. Um, so yeah, so that's the, the Airtable community. It's typically a, a good place where if you're looking for, um, you know, if you've got questions, also showing off. And then also people looking for work. Um, there is a place where you can hire a consultant, so that's pretty popular great way for companies that are looking for um, people to, to help them implement what they're doing. Um, the next community is our community. So Built on Air, builtonair.com, you can go to and, and read about what's going on. We actually do a summary every week of these communities and what's new in them. So it's a great way if you don't have time to spend all day inside of these communities and you just want to get an overview and then you can dig deeper if something piques your interest you can look at our community roundups the other thing that just got released yesterday is um, we do an overview of what's going on within the Airtable universe so this is where people post um, sample bases that they've built and they want to share off the cool base that they built there's a great universe of what's going on there and we keep track of all the new followers and everything everything going on, every, all the new bases and all the new people. This one was a little bit odd, um, the information. It actually might not be correct. I need to double check and look at this data because it, it seems odd with the data that came through. But every month you'll get, you'll get uh, an update of, of what's new in there. And then the other thing that we do in the, in the Built on Air is we actually have a Slack channel and Slack community, and there's lots of fun stuff. We've got non-Airtable conversations going on if you're curious about this interesting looking uh, uh, Tesla um, camper. You probably know the name Bill French. He's very popular in the, in the Airtable ecosystem. So that's a fun little side project he's working on call it that. <laughs> um, let's see, other conversations going on. We have different channels for if you're a developer and you're doing and you're doing um, developer specific stuff, this is a great way to get answers from other developers. And um, you see more technical stuff. Our friends at Sync uh, Inc. talk about what they're doing and they do great analysis of the API. Um, they posted that there. There's also um, just a general place to ask for help. We've got questions um, going on. 
and you know great help scott rose is another name that might be familiar helping people out with their formulas any other interesting stuff going on in our community i think a lot you know it's pretty similar to the airtable community of questions that you've got but I think I think you do see people maybe being a bit more uh, open about what kind of questions they're willing to ask. Might be a little bit more critical of of you know Airtable, and and so you get maybe maybe a different perspective of of Airtable in here. Fair, fair, and but honest, and um, but generally everybody is you know fans and using Airtable, so it's definitely a great resource to to get help. Yeah, I, you can kind of see that across the other communities as well. When it's not directly affiliated by Airtable, there's a bit more, uh, I don't know, you can feel the frustration a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of the times it's a little bit warranted because there's some quirks <laughs> in Airtable, which is why we have so many communities that uh, sprout up to answer other people's questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. So that's that's that. The next one is Reddit. And Reddit's kind of a mix of, of what you get. Um, not quite as active as, as some of the others, but still some interesting stuff going on. I always like these. You see these every once in a while of um, people not, you know, the billing system in Airtable is, is a challenge. Um, people don't quite understand how the billing works. And so unfortunately, this is somebody who got billed $400 they weren't expecting, um, which seems to happen quite often, fortunately. So it looks like they're getting answers on how that works and getting educated on, you know, you gotta be careful when you add people to a base or a, a workspace on how that affects your billing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Um, general questions. This is good. They actually, um, so it looks like the moderator has been, been more involved. That they're, they're adding labels on things so you can, you can uh, get a sense of what it is, what's going on. Data Fetcher seems to be making the rounds on all the podcasts. They're, they were on our podcast, I believe, mm -hmm. with Camille. Yes. So you can catch their episode on, on Built on Air as well, but it looks like they're making the rounds with all the podcasts and and getting the word out, which is great on their product. So, um, you know, it's a great place. Also, you see a lot of new products released. Reddit's a common place to, to put that on out there. Looks like Stackers um, advertising within Reddit. Softer is another third party. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you spend much time on on the Reddit side. Uh, Chris Dancy, who's also very popular in the community, he, he seems to frequent the Reddit quite a bit. Uh, we'll be talking about his community here actually coming up here. So the next one is is Facebook, which is pretty popular. It has might be the, the, the largest for 4,000 members um, outside of Airtable's community. And um, so you get maybe a little bit more uh, beginner level questions within here. Um, and I know, I know Ali, it seems like you, you frequent this quite a bit. I am, I'm finding myself more on this than I am on the Airtable community, and that's not through any anything on purpose. I think it's just because, like, with my phone, it's so much easier to pick up. And if I'm scrolling through Facebook, I'll answer a question. But the the uh, app for is it Discourse? Dis yeah, for the Airtable, it logs me out every time. Oh phone. really? It's just really weird. Yeah, yeah, and you have to be logged in. Yeah. Yeah, that one's kind of annoying. I'm on the yeah. Facebook community every now and again. I just, the, the my problem is I've kind of situated myself where the questions I answer often require building an automation or, or writing a script. And I don't want to type a script into the comments of a Facebook chat. So, <laughs> so I am mostly the community forums kind of 
it's where I, I go the most. Absolutely. You definitely see a lot more in the Facebook group, a lot more questions of like, what's wrong with this formula? And there's nothing wrong with it. It's just smart quotes. Mm -hmm. Just because people are trying to copy and paste from here into Airtable and it just gets all screwed up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. So that those the advantage of uh, the Airtable community forums, Slack, and even Reddit allow code blocks so you can uh, prevent little things like that and it's just easier to read. Um, but Facebook is um, seems to be good for kind of general questions or like where's a good place to look for resources and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and this is um, this is um, managed by by Ben Green, who is also um, a part of our community as well, and um, and they Ben Green and and Chris. Uh, Dancy host a another live show where they talk about you know similar stuff of what's going on and and they do theirs in um, <clears throat> well they live broadcast it but it's in um, drawing a blank what's the name of the new platform Clubhouse. Clubhouse Clubhouse thank you and so if you're on Clubhouse check out their Airtable. Um, weekly show i believe it's wednesday evenings yes if i'm not mistaken yep and so you'll get ben and and chris talking on there and then usually it'll show up in here which is where i've seen it mm -hmm. um and have seen a couple episodes so that's another great um community i'm not i'm not Cool enough, although I think I heard that, that Clubhouse is finally getting Android support, which is what I have, and so. Yeah, I'm, I have an Android too, and I uh, was disappointed I couldn't join in, but they've started, they've re they record their episodes and put them up. Um, yeah, I think, I think they, you can, I think you can, yeah. yeah. So they've kind of worked around that, but initially I was a little bummed out. <laughs> Yep. So I think they, they push it live to here and, and maybe to YouTube. So yeah, here's one of those episodes. So it looks like they're getting more guests on so you can follow their discussions of what they're, what they're talking about. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, so, so, so Facebook, if you're already on Facebook, I don't, I try to avoid Facebook as much as I can. So I'm usually not on here, but, um, it is a good place to see what, what people are talking about. All right, then let's go to YouTube. YouTube's always interesting. Um, this is where, you know, the big name here is, is definitely um, Gareth and his Gap Consulting, which Ali is also involved with. And so he probably has the largest YouTube channel that's Airtable related, I, I would imagine. Um, but there's a lot of other, other great videos, um, doing different things. So here's one talking about a new product that I saw that was just added to the marketplace, this notebook, um, that's an integration between Webflow and, uh, Airtable. Here's an episode, I actually saw this advertised on Instagram. And I didn't make the live showing, but I, I, I want to watch it. It's with the CEO of Airtable, Howie Liu, who um, was speaking at a Stanford event, Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders. And so I, I, I've added this to my watch list. Um, be interesting to see what, what he's saying about the vision for, for Airtable and, and what he's thinking. I've heard him speak um, in the past. He, he's not super public. He, he doesn't seem like he's not always out there, um, maybe like some other CEOs, but but you can catch a couple um, clips of him talking about it. And I remember him, this was years ago when he spoke, when Airtable first started and kind of his vision of it being, you know, the new platform that you write code on top of. And that's when I kind of started to get the glimpse of like the potential of Airtable of what it could be as far as a revolutionary type platform to, to change how how software is is built and developed so worth hearing his his words there any other YouTube channels 
you guys come across? Um, all about that base. Um, uh, they do kind of like quick little tutorial videos. Um, pretty great. Um, Gareth, yeah, of course, is kind of the king of the air table, yeah. <laughs> uh, YouTube verse, if you will. But there, there are a couple. There's one. There's one whose name is escaping me right now. But they had recently begun a YouTube channel that was um, uh, more targeted tutorials about how to build a custom app. Um, which which is nice. I just wish I could remember the name, yeah. but it's live, and so <laughs> <laughs> I we'll, don't we'll recall get that it. Next time. Yeah, that's good. I'm Maybe sure as soon as this episode is over, it's going to come to me. So yeah, so all about that base. That's with Justin, um, who we know well. Mm -hmm. It looks like the automate all the things. I think is broader than Airtable, but he seems to do a lot of Airtable. Um, really yeah, he works for Airtable as well. Oh, see? yeah, that's Aaron oh. Cornblit. That's Aaron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So he, um, interesting. I did, I've, I've met him before over Zoom, but um, he was on the podcast too. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I think he started this before, and then and then he joined Airtable. Okay, that makes table. sense. Yeah, but it looks like he's still keeping it going. So that's good. Ben Green, Ben's also been doing a lot. Um, so he's got some good content. And he also has a training course that's that's with Built on Air that I'll be talking about a little bit later. So he's a great resource to follow. We got Content Cal. This would be a great place to show off Master Calendar. <laughs> so you have to reach What's out that? to whoever's behind that. <clears throat> We will find out. Another thing we'll learn today. Here we go. Hey, those <laughs> do look familiar. That's us. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So lots of lots of new videos coming out. So each week we'll kind of see what's new. This first one we'll kind of get a glimpse, and then we'll just kind of keep it to to just that week's worth, um, and go from there. So that's kind of uh, rounding the bases and seeing what's going on with the community and where you can go to, to find out more information. If there's a community out there that we're not aware of, feel free to let us know uh, via comments or join, join our Slack community. That's the easiest way to quickly contact me or any of the others and let us know. So at this time, I'm gonna, we're gonna take a quick sponsor break and um, being one of the hosts of this, I, I'm going to take the luxury of, of promoting one of our products. So um, my company, OpenSide, we are the developers of the on to air suite of products, which is a complete suite of products that, that help companies run on top of Airtable. So if you're running your business on Airtable, I believe on to air is an essential component to that. And our application that runs inside of Airtable that you can see alongside of it is called Amplify. And it's a complete editor for doing anything in Airtable. All of your Airtable fields can be modified and it's a better layout for um, how you set up your Airtable data. So in this episode, I'm gonna just show our search functionality. So this application, you can fully navigate your entire base all from in here. So some people use this as their entire UI for interacting with their data and no longer leave it to go back to the, the grid system. You can see one record at a time and view all your, your records in, in different layouts that you configure. And then as far as navigating between, um, between records, I'm gonna navigate to a different table. So I'm gonna look at this, this base is actually our um, our base that we use to run this podcast, and it has all of the guests that we've had on in the past. And um, I'm gonna unsync it here so I can go back to full screen and not get that pop up. And basically the ability to, to navigate between bases, we have the search functionality that allows you to search any field. So if you're familiar with Airtable searching, typically you can only search the primary key, so you can't search um, other fields. But if I wanted to search um, 
for somebody that um, based off of their project or based off of their email or I could even um, configure this to I want to display different fields here um, of course there's some bugs here so we'll get those fixed um, so if I want to search for something in their bio maybe I want to find all founders I can search there and it will actually highlight where it found the matches. And you see I'm searching fields other than the primary field, which is their name. So here I can see all people that, that were founders. And these ones probably the, the founder showed up later in the bio and it's cutting it off there. But you can find, you can search by different fields and um, you can fully navigate everything within here. You can configure your searching and what fields get displayed, what fields you're searching and um, a whole other lots of stuff. So each episode will highlight a different aspect of onto air, um, either within this Amplify app or within our other, um, we have six apps all together that you can use for a variety of different use cases. So feel free to check it out on to air.com is where you'll find it on the number two, then air.com. So with that, let's navigate on to our next segment, which we call an app a day. So what we're gonna do here is highlight an application from the marketplace. So if you, you have to be on a pro plan to use any apps, but once you um, have access to the apps, it's a great way to expand upon Airtable. And um, I think we're gonna see an explosion of apps over time that do a variety of things. Obviously our Amplify app, um, the one we're going to highlight today makes sense since we have Camille on here. And you look in the all apps, um, you've got the apps by Airtable, which are nice, but the ones that I think are really good are the apps built by third party developers, um, obviously being biased there. But we're going to look at this master calendar. And Camille, I'm going to ask, since she is the creator of this, if you give us an overview and I'll start downloading it, but why don't you talk us through what it does? Sure. Um, so, uh, <laughs> well, about it, like a year ago, Airtable made a contest for third party developers to uh, make their own custom app when the custom app functionality became a thing. And Master Calendar was actually my first idea for that contest. I actually built something else for it. Um, but in the back of my mind, Master Calendar has been in existence for forever. Um, what it does is it kind of circumvents a limitation to uh, Airtable calendar views where you can only have one, um, you can only show records from one table in a calendar, um, which is useful. But if you have more than one table with date fields and you want to look at everything at once, you would need some other solution. And I hope that solution is Master Calendar. Yeah, it's it's really powerful and very well designed. It looks great. Why, um, thank you. Um, <laughs> it, it also gets around, a, like, I didn't realize this before, but Scott Rose pointed it out, um, where Airtable's calendar views um, on the calendar it will display the primary field of the record every time. In Master Calendar, uh, you can actually pick which field you want shown on the calendar. So I, uh, you know, I, I added that because it's, it felt like it made sense. It, I didn't really think of it in, in terms of solving another problem. But if you don't have that many bases uh, or that many tables with date fields, but you still wanted to show a different field on the calendar, you can do that with Master Calendar. And you might not need an account with me um, to, you know, <laughs> you won't be able to edit things. I'll talk about limitations with or without an account. But um, yeah. we're currently looking at uh, the setup screen for Master Calendar. It runs on what I call feeds, where each feed is a collection of records. It could You could have 10 feeds from one table, or you could have 10 feeds from 10 tables. Um, as you go in and start adding... Uh, you know, filling out each of these different settings, the red X will turn into a green check mark if it's a required field. If it's not required, it will be a gray check mark. Um, so you can have 
all of your records color coded. Um, if you select a table in view, that will con control um, things like how the records are kind of ordered aside from the date and time themselves. If they appear at the same exact date and time, the view will help control things. It will also filter your records down so you don't have, you know, records from 10 years ago showing up in your calendar if you don't need to. Um, it supports date fields and date time fields. It also supports uh, formulas and uh, roll-ups that have the format of a date. You won't be able to edit those, of course, because those are calculated fields, but you can still display them on the calendar if you need to. Great. I was going to ask that. So it's intelligent there to know which fields are formatted as dates, which ones yes. are Yes. Um, you can try setting it up with a formula that is not uh, formatted as a date. It just won't show up on the calendar. Um, but it, you, won't, you won't flash an error or anything like that. All right, so we've created one feed. Um, to add a feed, it looks like it's down here. Mm -hmm. So we could add a second feed. So let's do that, I believe. And each feed has to have at least one date field, right? Each table. Y yes, you need at least a start field. You don't need an end field for it to work. Some things are like all day events, for instance. Um, so you don't need to add it, which is why it will show up as a, green, a gray check mark at the bottom. Um, and if you fill it out, it'll just turn green. Okay. All right. So let's see what this looks like. So we're going to hit done. <laughs> let's hope it works. Yeah. Okay. So the problem here is I, I just installed this base off of the universe. Mm -hmm. And because of that, all the dates are probably outdated because it's not a relatively new base. So they're not showing up in the current. So it looks like so back in 2020. So why don't we go yeah. back? So we'll just navigate to, there we go. There we go. Aha, they're there. Yes, very cool. That looks awesome. So why don't you explain what we're looking at here? Um, so yeah, uh, based on the colors that Dan selected in the settings panel, um, those represent how they are color coded on the calendar. Um, that you know quickly lets you set things up based on, uh, uh, so you could see the different uh, feeds. If you have it memorized in your head, you can quickly see. Oh, purple means draft date, for instance, um, and blue means publish date or something like that. Um, if you click the expand uh, sidebar button, you will be able to see a list of all of the currently visible um, events, you know, that are displayed on the screen, even if you can't quite see them. Um, some of them have multiple dates on the same, you know, day that you have to kind of click into to see in greater detail, but they all appear on the sidebar there. And as you switch views, it will refilter that list of 16 events. So if you change to week view, for instance, less um, records will show up because less records are visible. Um, if you click on any of the events on the calendar or the events in the sidebar, it will expand um, Airtable's regular record, uh, single record view. So you can edit things really, really quickly. Um, or if you know the name of a record um, or the uh, whatever label field you have selected for display on the calendar, you can search for it using the find event button in the um, uh, in the sidebar, and it will actually jump to that date that that record appears on. I believe it will go into week view um, to sh display the date. Um, but if you know, I want to find the record with boat in the title or something like that, you can use find event and it'll jump to that place on the calendar. Nice. So there you have it. Um, what else does this thing do? Um, <laughs> a lot of my time has been spent in designing master calendar. It's fairly complex under the hood. Um, if you have a pro account with Chameleon Air uh, apps, you will be able to edit the records that you see on the calendar. Um, so Dan, I don't believe, has logged in. So if you try to drag and drop a um, event right now, a little pop-up will appear at the bottom corner. Um, just click and drag anything on the calendar. Um, um. 
from the here. calendar from the calendar interface itself. Like if you click and drag an event, gotcha. Uh -huh. It'll say, yeah. "Please log in." Um, and same thing with uh, clicking and dragging like uh, time blocks or between days to create a new event, much like you would do with like Google Calendar or anything else. Um, the same kind of pop up would appear. Um, so I am offering subscriptions for $5 a month, and you can install it in any number of bases that you choose. Um, and with $5 a month, you will be able to edit existing um, records by clicking and dragging, adding new records by clicking and dragging. You would also be able to look at any record being pulled in from the feeds um, that doesn't have a start date uh, assigned to it, and you can click and drag a uh, start and end time or a period of time and assign it to an unscheduled record. Um, so that's nice. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is awesome. This is great. If you're, if you're heavily into dates and, um, doing a lot of calendaring, this is a very useful tool to add to your repertoire and, support Camille. So for only $5 a month, you can get all that added functionality. And um, I think it's extremely useful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I hope it is because it took a year to make. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely it, is. It, it wouldn't have taken so long if it wasn't, uh, if it was the main thing that I do because it, right. you know, I have other stuff. Uh, that's I why it took so long, say. but um, Master Calendar, now available on the Airtable Marketplace as of, I think, a week ago. Yeah. Cool. So thank you, Camille. So each each episode will kind of highlight a different app and just play with it and see how it's useful. Some of them we might not be as familiar as we are with, with this one, um, having our host be the, the creator of it. But, but it's a great place. Should be spending time looking at what's new, and um, we'll actually be tracking. We actually are in the process of starting to track the marketplace like we do the universe. So, within our builtonair.com um, website, you'll be able to to we'll, we'll start posting all the new apps that are launched each month, and or updated, and and get a better feel of of what's going on in the marketplace. So. We're all optimistic that that marketplace grows and, and is thriving and can be a large resource for um, companies to really expand um, their Airtable uh, usage because Airtable is never going to be able to create all the functionality that, that people want and need, and nor should they. I think really they play the role of being the, the platform and being the, the source of truth for your data, and I think third parties provide a valuable role in, in building on top of that and, and really customizing to the specific different use cases. So be sure to, to keep an eye on the marketplace of, of what's going on there. So next episode, we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to dive into automations. And we're going to play, so this is called Automate Create this episode and we're going to play around a little bit with our with our automations um, automations launched what 6 months ago about Maybe longer yeah about that last last summer i think um, of 2020 and it, it was really a game changer when 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 automations launched it just completely changed what is possible Prior, I know, you know, at least Ali and I lived in Zapier or maybe Integramat. Um, to be able to make any of your data actionable, you needed some other third party resource that used the API. So once they launched the, the automations, uh, first they launched scripting, which was nice, but it wasn't, you know, triggerable off of, off of data changes. Um, but now with the automations, Airtable truly can be a platform that is fully extendable and, and comes to life, allows your data to, to come to life. So you've got to be you got to be using automations to, to do anything, you know, beyond basic spreadsheet type data storage in your in your Airtable. So what we're going to do is we're going to. Um, 
we're going to simulate, and this, this will likely be a two-part series, where we're going to talk through what is involved in creating an automation that allows you to send data from one base to another. So another feature that Airtable added um, last year was the sync functionality, which is also great that automatically will sync data from one table from one table to another, um, either across bases, typically across bases, and so you can set up a, a table. The problem there is if you have data that's synced, you can't update it, so it's kind of um, locked and, and you can only update it from the source. So we, we, I know in talking to a lot of customers, that, that's great, but that's not ideal for some use cases, and they want to be able to be able to edit data on the destination side of where that data is going. So here's a different approach. Um, I wouldn't, you know, typically I would recommend using the, the sync feature if you need to get data from one table, one base to another. But there are use cases where you don't want it to be locked on the destination, and you, but you do want to push data over from another. So we're going to create a, a custom, um, custom automation. And for our trigger, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we'll just keep it simple. We're going to do when record matches conditions, which is typically the, the one I'd recommend. And we're going to push every time a design project in this base gets updated. So we'll pick that table. And our conditions will be um, every time, um, oh, that's right, with this one, let's do, um, why, don't, why don't we do it manual? Any, any thoughts on, as I'm walking through this, feel free to chime in on, on things you know about um, automations or, or what's typically worked for you. Uh, I just know it's one kind of thing that uh, is sometimes difficult to get your head around with um, what each of the triggers for the automations kind of mean. Um, you know, the biggest one is um, if people are creating a new record um, and they want the trigger to fire when they're done with the record, Airtable has to know what being done with the record means. And so when record is created, it's, it's literal. It, if the record is created, it will fire right then and there, even if you haven't typed anything into the record yet. The record was created, and that's all it's looking for. Um, so just something to be in, uh, mindful of when selecting the triggers for your uh, automations uh, when record is created is probably the one that is the most not necessarily problematic, but misunderstood. It's only really useful for if you don't need any data in the record or if data is only coming in via a form mm -hmm. um, or via some sort of API. Because when you send a record via a form or API, all of the data gets sent at once. But if you're typing stuff in manually, obviously all the other fields haven't been filled out yet while you're in column A, if you will. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's like, it's similar in that same vein for when a record matches conditions. A lot of people will pick that and say, okay, once I've filled in a client email address, send them an email, but it'll trigger once you've put in just one letter because that yes. field is no longer empty. So you have to really kind of think through and add like after I haven't modified this field for over two minutes or something to that effect. Um, Another big trick I use all the time, and I might be getting a little ahead of myself, but like I always, the last step of my automation, typically speaking, is to go back and update that record and either check a box or fill in a date and time saying, yep, did it. Because if you don't, then there's a chance that automation could trigger for that record over and over and over again. Like even if you just accidentally uncheck a box, it matches that condition and it goes out. So I always have some sort of secondary layer on top of that to prevent it from accidentally firing again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very true. That's, that's a great best practice there. <clears throat> okay, so what I did was I set up a checkbox that is a sync. So for this use case, you could automate this to where anytime a field is updated, but 
to keep it simple, we're, I'm going to require you to check this checkbox, and then that's what will trigger it to, to send the data over. So I tested it, so now we're all good. Now the next step, we're going to use a new feature that just got released, I believe, a month or two ago, and it's called um, webhooks. And what we need to do is I'm going to the second base that we're going to be pushing the data to, and you need to go there, and we're setting up a new automation that is when webhook received. And what this is, is this, this webhook is a unique URL that anytime any data is pushed to this webhook, it will start a new automation. And so you can have automations that are triggered programmatically from other um, sources. So this could be uh, Zapier, Integromat, or in our case, it could be another um, step in a, in a, from another base, or it could be within the same base. I, I use this for one automation to talk to another. So it's a great way to, to break out your automations if you don't, if you want. Um, so one use case I found this very useful is I have tables that all need to push to another table, but I had to write some script that I didn't want to replicate in all of the automations that are set up for all the tables. So I, so I created one automation that has all of my main logic and code and then the other automations just send to that the information that it needs. And then now I can keep my code all modular using the concept of DRY, which stands for don't repeat yourself, which is a useful programming concept of not repeating code so that if you ever have to make changes, you're only making them in one place. So webhooks allows for, for functionality like that. Very useful. So what you do is you just set this up. It provides this URL and you just copy it. And then now I'm going back to the other um, one where we're gonna be sending data to that webhook. And now to do this, they don't have an action that, that helps to automate it. So you do have to kind of roll up your sleeves a little bit and go into the run script task. And now we're gonna be testing my live uh, programming skills. Um, You're very brave. Yes, I know. Luckily, they have a great editor that helps uh, that helps um, auto complete. So I'm gonna do this. All I'm gonna do is pass the record ID for now. It's the same concept to to do everything else, but um, but you're gonna get the data from input.config. And it sees here, you see the squiggly sign because I need to create an input variable. So I'm gonna do my record ID. So this needs to match that. And then the value will just be from the first step. We'll just get our, our record ID. So right now we're just gonna get this ID just so we have some data. Overall, you'd, may, you'd likely add all of the, the fields that you wanted. Um, uh, let's just get name. <clears throat> And so we'll add name. So now I'm going to get the name and the record ID from our input config. So this is coming from whichever record gets triggered in the first step. And then all we need to do is call our fetch function. So fetch is a, is a built-in function that will pass information to, um, to the URL that they gave us. So I pasted in the, the webhook for the URL. And um, now I'm being tested here. Okay, so this, this returns a promise. So we need to add our await to it, which will tell it to, to hold there until the function gets returned. Um, I'll get my response back, and then we'll just do a console.log of Uh, with this JSON, there we go. Okay. And I believe we need a body here and we have to convert it to a string, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now here we have our um, name and record ID. 
And if you're not familiar with this syntax, um, this is all JavaScript code. And, but, you know, so this can get a little bit tricky. Um, we're also going to need to pass in some headers. Tell me if I'm doing this wrong. I'm going off of, I use in, there's different libraries and they all have different ways to, to do your query. So, um, we need our content type to tell mm -hmm. it. So this is telling the, the message that our body is, is JSON. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe this should do it. Do you need a method too? Post? I think, yeah, yeah, I think, oh yeah, that's right. Thank you. And I believe for webhooks to work, it always has to be a post. I don't mm -hmm. think it works with get, but I'm not 100% sure there. I'm pretty sure, yeah, because when they receive it, that's when they're getting it. Yeah. Yeah, because if you don't use a post, you can't really pass any data. They don't. They don't accept URL parameters. Is my understanding. Yeah. So a get a get can't pass in a body. Um, only a post or a or a put can. So let's run this and see what happens. We should expect to see a OK success response. Like 200 or something. Ah. Yeah, we didn't get an answer back. I wonder if it's, I can't remember if JSON is a promise. I think it is. There we go. Yeah, yeah so okay. response.json returns a promise, so I needed to add my await. So there we got our success true. So we pushed this information over to this side. So now if we run our test here, it ran successfully and let's see if we got our data. So this is the webhook and there you see we got our name and our record ID. And so what we would have to do now is just simply, let's say we wanna um, sync up with, with this one here. Um, now this is where it gets a little bit tricky to, to find the, the match. Um, Let's. Um, Would you essentially need two automations running, like one when the record is created, and like create another record in the other table you're syncing to, and copy the first record ID to the other one, and then do the reverse, take the table two's record ID and copy it to table one's, and then that's done, and then the second automation is the one we're building right now to update as record change well I think you have uh, the same issue right where on that first one you got to know how to to do a lookup now in Airtable they do have an update record um, but you got to know the record ID mm -hmm. right and so yeah so what you're saying is if we knew this record ID in the other base um, then we could send that along and say, this is the one that you're updating. Yeah, that, that's why I would have two automations, like the instant a new record is made in table one, gotcha. well, you, would need, you would need four automations, I think, total. One in table A, as soon as a record is created in table A, make a new record in table B uh, using the webhook uh, kind of uh, scenario where we just kind of watched and then <laughs> and then do the reverse. I know it makes sense in my head. There's a yeah. chart. We, I need to make a chart, but there's, you need one set of automations to run when a record is created so that they can copy the record IDs to each other. And then mm -hmm. the second set is the one we're building now, which, you know, assumes we know which record ID to update. Um, otherwise we would have to do some kind of like find record step where right. we, you know, find some means to match the records together if we don't know the record ID ahead of time. Yeah. Another option would be to have a sync table going from one base to the other and then linking them together just by the primary key and then have like then you'd have the record ID of the sync table in the source yeah. base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all those are all uh, workarounds. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> not ideal. Well, right. the way I would probably do it, being comfortable in, in scripting is, right. is if we did a scripting step here, then you can then you can loop through all of the items and, and look for our existing source ID that wouldn't require those extra steps. Um, so I think we we've reached our time limit. One of the, you know, this being live, I think it's great to, to learn all this. What we'll do is that on our next episode, we'll continue this of how we would um, perform that that step to to uh, link it via script and, and talk through that. Um, I always, you know, it's a challenge if, if you're not strong with scripting, there's definitely workarounds, there's, there's Zapier. We actually, um, another plug for onto air, we actually have functionality that would make this easier that we, we have a concept, I mean, it's not our concept, but it's called an upsert. And what an upsert is, is it will update it if it finds a match based off of a field. But if it doesn't find a match, it will then create a new record. And that's really helpful for, um, so it's basically an if match is found, then update, else create a new record. And that's really what you wanna be doing with a sync is if, if, it, if you find that matching ID, then update, otherwise we wanna create a new record. So that upsert functionality is available in our Ontario products, our Ontario actions. It would come in handy here. But next episode, stick with us. We're gonna we're gonna dive deeper into this. But in this one, we kind of highlight the um, how the web hooks work and how you can talk from one base to another. And then next time we'll we'll dig into how you how you perform that lookup and and matching process via script. So. Very useful, um, and you can kind of see how how work is done and how it usually takes much longer than, than you'd expect it to. <laughs> <laughs> but once you do it, once you set it up, it's an automation, so it will yep. just do it for you from then on, yep. which is nice. Yep. You just kind of have to hunker down. As long as you don't change anything, part. don't don't touch it after right. that. Right. <laughs> if you start to rename fields. Yep. <laughs> that you might run into an issue. Well, not with the yep. method you show, you show using input config, but if you do right. it all within the body of the script, if you start renaming fields, you kind of have to go back and rename what you called it in the script. So yep. Yep. be wary of yeah. data schema. Yeah, anybody that's done some serious uh, coding with this and you just think, oh, I got to rename this one field, it won't affect anything. and. Sure enough, some some automation is tied to that and famous up. last words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very true. I'll add a hyphen. Yep. <laughs> Tragedy. Yep. Ruins your whole day. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take another quick um, ad break here and um, talk about built on air training. So this is part of our um, built on air brand and like we've mentioned before, there's a lot of amazing experts in our community and we decided to give them a chance to really showcase their talents. And so we launched a, a training platform. So if you are looking for more serious training and you want a guided um, process to, to get you up to speed on, on different aspects of Airtable, check out training.builtonair.com. And you'll see we our initial launch. Um, this is brand new. We're just launching this now. So we're just getting the word out. And um, we, we have three courses currently. Two of them are put together by Ben Green, who we mentioned earlier, who has a YouTube channel and also um, manages the Facebook community. And also Jen Rudd, who's also an amazing uh, Airtable consultant has put together a, what we've been talking about, integrations and how to, how to do integrations with Airtable. So if you're just getting started to Airtable, check out Ben's course. If you're responsible for managing your account and need to learn all the different ways that you can do the account management, he's, Ben has a second course. And if you're doing integrations, uh, check out Jen's course. So each of these has an intro video you can, you can watch and get a better sense of it's all about and um, both of these people really know their stuff we we I've met with them many times um, has as has Ali and Camille and so 
highly recommend you checking them out. And then we'll be adding more courses over time. The goal is to have a large community, a large resource of, of paid content that, that goes deeper than um, some of the traditional stuff that might be out there and, and really useful for, for those who are um, taking their Airtable want to take it to the next level, especially in a corporate setting. So training.builtonair.com is where you need to check out for, for these courses. All right, our final segment for today. We're going to see how it goes. We're running a little bit late, but we're going we're gonna to do this. Um, assuming you guys are good on time. <clears throat> okay, so now time for our challenge. I'm excited about this. Um, we're going to pit Camille and Ali against each other and, and see how it goes. So I picked a base just, um, and they are just finding out about it today. So they haven't had uh, previous experience looking at this. And what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to challenge each of them to take this base up a notch and ways that they can improve it in a 15-minute um, period. We're going to see what they can do. So think of it as like Iron Chef, um, one chef against another. These are two great uh, Airtable experts. You'll get a glimpse into how they think and how they're looking at um, the data and, and just general tips and tricks on, on ways to improve any, any data. So this will hopefully be a valuable resource in, in seeing ways that, that you can improve it. And it will also be fun to see um, how, we can, how we can react on the fly. So both Ali and Camille are, are installing, if they haven't already, this base into their own environment. Mm -hmm. And we're going to just talk with each of them and kind of think through what it is that when they look at a base, um, how they how they might dissect it and um, do that. So, with that, you guys good? You got your you got it installed? Yep. Okay. All right. So I'll probably I'll give you guys time. Um, feel free to quiet it down if you need some time to think. But go ahead and get started looking at it. Um, feel free to get started working. I'll grab one of you after I go through it and explore it um, in general, kind of talk about what's in here, and then we'll, we'll get your thoughts on it. So I picked this um, competitor analysis tracker. So it's essentially a simple, I wanted it simple so that we could expand upon it. Um, it's a base that just has um, two, two tables, a company's table and an incidence table. And the companies is just a list of companies. Some you might recognize um, from TV and movies. And um, it's just a way to keep information about your competitors. So if you're a company and you want to track all your competitors, what they're doing, where they're at, um, this is a good base to get started to, to do that. So it looks like they've got three views here, the main grid view. They've got a, a gallery view that displays it a little bit nicer. And then they, it looks like they separate. They have a view for just their international competitors, so if they are international. And then it looks like they're, they're keeping track of um, incidents. So each time it looks like any kind of interaction that they have with these competitors, they keep track of it. So kind of a log of, of incidents that, um, that um, they uh, have with them. So you can, this again, this is coming from the universe. Go to airtable.com slash universe. And they've got a ton of these. Th these are really great for getting ideas um, and having starting points to, to begin. And you'll really, it'll open your eyes of the different types of things that you could track in Airtable by, by looking through the universe. So with that, uh, do we have a volunteer to go first? Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And Camille, if you wanna share your screen. Sure. Going. Um. All right. Well, I did a thing really quickly. Um, first thing I did, um, I kind of took the multi-select field um, that stored where each company was in which region it was uh, based in 
um, and I made a duplicate of it. Um, in reality, I wouldn't have two of these fields. I would pick one or the other. Um, I duplicated it so I could turn it into a link to another record type field so that I can have a table for regions. And with that, I was able to add a count field to figure out how many companies I have that are based in the US versus um, in the UK, um, et cetera, France, et cetera. So um, it kind of gets that's around a, common, a limit. Sorry, yeah, that's, that's a common trade-off. When you think about um, when to create a separate, t separate table versus a drop-down, what are, what are some things you think about? When, when do you choose one versus the other? Yeah, it's, it's a matter of um, when you need actionable metrics. Um, and uh, you're kind of, you're a little bit at with both of these options. If I wanted to group um, by the region, for instance, it collapses multi-select options anytime it's an array. So even if I grouped by the other field, you're kind of in the same boat, you wouldn't be able to separate out um, US from France from UK if they're based in multiple different companies. So that's the same drawback no matter what, but um, you can get a count of US only um, records using the kind of group field, but you can't access that number two anywhere. But if you wanted to um, be able to use that data in any meaningful way, you could have your own table for um, regions, and then you can get a true count of how many um, how many companies are based in the U.S. Um, and um, because it uh, with lookups or rollups or count fields, you can include conditions. You could. Um, you could set it so that um, you could be a little bit more specific. So if you wanted to uh, customize it so that it's only based in US, you can kind of do that. It's a little bit finicky on how you would do that, but it's a little bit more possible if you go through this method. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and how you did it was just a simple copy and paste and it mm -hmm. automatically so you didn't come here and type in all those regions? No, all I did was um, I right clicked um, and create said duplicate field just so I can show the before and after. Um, then I, with my copied one, I said customize field type and I changed it to link to another record. Then I said create a new table. I'm gonna leave it say regions copy two. And then it will take all of what was originally in there and it will make records for um each um value that it had found so yeah, every all of great. the links kind of set up by themselves that's a great trick to to not have to type all that in manually so mm -hmm. very very useful and that and you pointed out one of the biggest issues i, I hope someday that airtable will figure out a way to do the group by where it um you know, it can do an individual group instead of all of them together, like that second region. Yeah, um, I can understand the, You'd from like duplicating a, records. you would be duplicating records. Yeah. And so, you know, I could see that being a challenge, but yeah. uh, it would be nice. Yeah. Because this yeah. isn't this isn't super useful when you think about it. Um, right. This exact combination of, of regions yeah. is not um, <laughs> doesn't it's, help. It's not helpful. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine anything like that, where if you had like a clothing table where this shirt is available in red, black, green, I don't need to know how many <laughs> shirts are available in this exact color combination. Yeah. Right. You know. Cool. All right, we're gonna we're gonna let you keep working. Maybe maybe do one more uh, upgrade, and then we're gonna switch it. If you want to stop sharing your screen, I don't know how. Help. Down at the bottom. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right, there. And then Allie, if you want to share your screen, see what yeah. you're working on. All right. Can you see it? Yep. Yes. All right. So I had basically the same. I love Camille's idea. That is exactly what I would do as well. I would definitely nice. break this out into its own table because you can get a lot more meaningful data doing that. Um, the first thing I did was I started, I added a couple of the new view sections, which I am obsessed with. 
Um, absolutely could not be happier about that feature. Um, also added a count field and started, you know, playing with organizing this by how many incidents a company has. Um, another little trick that I like to do. So I actually changed this uh, primary key to be a formula based on the company name and the incident. Um, I find it comes a lot more helpful, especially if I'm like trying to find a particular record and maybe I have two items in here that say met owners. And now I'm like, okay, well, what company was that for? I just want to have the most meaningful data in this primary key. Um, but then it gets a little funky because let's say I am actually, I'm going to change this back just to demonstrate why I'm doing this. For Dunder Mifflin, something I see a lot of people have trouble with is if they wanted to add a new incident, they might just start scrolling through this list and see client mentioned Goliath National Bank or something and pick one from this list, even though these are all existing incidents for other companies. So I have a little trick that I often employ and I create a view that's filtered to show nothing. So I just have this filtered where the name is empty and by virtue of the formula here, if there's a row, it's gonna have at least this pipe character in it. So every nothing should ever be on this view, technically speaking. Um, and then I name it, click add new record. So that way, because I can point this to a particular view, I'll click save. Now, when I go to add something for Dunder Mifflin, it's telling me, click add new record. <laughs> That's pretty smart. <laughs> it's like such a small little thing, but I've found it's really helpful and it, it prevents people from accidentally linking old records to a different company or like a lot of data error um, prevention. And then finally I added a little roll up field or a formula field here that concatenates the date and then the notes from the incident. So that way on my company's table, I could start to roll that up. And let's say I add another one for Wayne Enterprises. We'll put in Now I've got a dated list of all of my notes that I can start looking at just right from this table. Um, and the only bummer about this part is that if you want this to be sorted in a certain way, you'd have to write a script or an automation to get this to, like this, these dates fall in the same order as this field. So if I move this above that, now it starts with a, that date first. I, I don't think I realized you could drag those like that. That's cool though. <laughs> it's really cool. I have a script that I wrote that uh, every time like something's added to this field, it alphabetizes it. So that way I've got this ends up in the same order I want every yeah. time. Yeah. Cool. Those are nice. Those are nice tricks. Very cool. awesome. Thank you, Ali. Camille, any, any new stuff or? Uh, I added a pivot table, but that's about it. I did that too, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a go-to. I mean, when you have uh, at least one single or multi-select field, a pivot table is just always kind of nice. Um, if you have a pro workspace, you can use apps, and one of those apps is pivot table. Yep, yep, very useful tool um, for sure to add in. Awesome. So. Nice tricks. Um, I learned some stuff from that. That was pretty cool. So we'll see how we'll see how the judges decide. Um, we'll let the audience decide on who made the best uh, enhancements there. But both both amazing, cool tricks. Um, so yeah, I think this will be a fan favorite episode of of seeing your minds and what you can do to to enhance the Airtable experience. So. With that, any closing remarks as we end our first episode of our live show? Oh, I'm excited. Go get Master Calendar.
Yes. <laughs> check out Master Calendar. Check out um, and Amplify. Both of you, yeah, feel free to, to reach out of both of you. Um, uh, if you're available for, for work, I don't know if either of you are looking for work or you're both, both of you have day jobs, I believe, and so your time is, is limited and we appreciate you, you joining and feel free to join us next Tuesday, 11 a.m. Eastern, and we'll start getting the word out and we want feedback. We want to hear what everybody thinks as well as questions, um, ideas for new segments. We want to bring people on. We want to, if you have a specific challenge that you want us to take on on this show, let us know and we'll see if we can tackle it. So thank you, everybody, and have a great week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to check out our sponsor, ontair.com, and we will see you next time on the Built On Air podcast. <laughs>